All right, we don't normally introduce who's going to speak, but we're going to do that today because it's Jeff Maxwell. He's not my son. He's not my cousin. He's not my uncle. He's, but he's a, he's, a, he's a dear friend, and he's my small group leader. So Jeff um, is going to preach this morning. You know at Grace Bible Church, we are committed to discipling uh, men and women and boys and girls. You know that um, we are eager to... Um, see men and women learn how to shepherd their hearts well and, and uh, impact their homes with the gospel and then step into ministry in the church and beyond the church. You know that. Um, and it happens all across the, the, the spectrum. We, we do that sometimes very programmatically on purpose, like with Build and Wellspring and student ministries and things like that. We um, do it in small groups where we're trying to really care for each other and disciple one another so that we look more like Jesus Christ. Um, one of the other ways that we do that is also through leadership development and training men for ministry. Jeff has been a part of um, what we used to call Grace Bible Institute, uh, four years of that, three, three years of that. Um, and you know, recently uh, the Expositor Seminary just came under the umbrella of our church and is now a ministry of this local church. And so he's finishing up another year last year here uh, under a the training uh, that the Expositor Seminary has to offer that we have here. And uh, Jeff is being discipled to be a pastor, be an elder, be an overseer, to shepherd people. And I can tell you um, from his friendship in my life and his small group leadership that um, he is a shepherd. He has a shepherd's heart. And he is, um, he is very careful with the Word of God. And you're going to be blessed as he comes and he opens his um, uh, opens the Bible for you and shares what God has put on his heart. So let's welcome up Jeff. Please come on up. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be taking a break from our regular sermon series in the book of Romans. We're going to be moving one book to the right into 1 Corinthians. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, before we start, let's go ahead and pray. God, I thank you for the gift of disciplers, the gift of pastors and elders and church members who have cared for me well, who continue to care for one another well. Lord, we thank you for the preaching that we get every week. Um, I pray that our, our time in the Word today would honor you. I pray that through these words, you would be honored, that we would increase in our thankfulness for your great works in our lives. Lord, help us to be ever thankful for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. As I said, this morning we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll be in verses 4 through 9 this morning. We're going to be reading about something that the Apostle Paul said was always true for him. Something that was always true for him. Now, when we use the term always, we are quite frequently exaggerating. We often don't use it literally. Dolly Parton wrote the famous song, I Will Always Love You. It was later made famous by Whitney Houston. She wrote this song as a sort of tribute to her duet partner to let him know that there was no hard feelings as she separated into a solo career. This love was surely put to the test a few years later when they sued each other over contract disputes. I will always find time for the gym, said 20-year-old, unmarried, childless me. In spite of my best intentions, this statement has proven to be false. Jello, that strange, slimy snack that some of you enjoy, they had a slogan that started in the 60s. They said, There is always room for Jello. And while I haven't tested this hypothesis, I don't know. I don't like it. I suspect that it isn't true. I, I understand that it doesn't take up too much space but there are physical limitations we're dealing with. Always room for jello. Well, at, at some point, there is no more room for jello. Our overuse and our over exaggeration of this word may cause our hearing to be dulled when we hear it used literally and seriously. 
But this morning when we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the Apostle Paul was always giving thanks. He said, I thank my God always. We need to take him at face value. Paul knew exactly what he was saying when he said that he gave thanks all the time. He gave thanks always. Paul expressed his constant thankfulness regarding the church in Corinth based upon the works of God accomplished in those who have been saved by God. These works of God gave him reason for thanksgiving no matter what, always. In the midst of both great highs and great lows, there's always reasons, there's always cause for thankfulness to God. And the, the apostle experienced plenty of both. We know from our New Testament he saw great evangelistic successes, and yet he spent much time in chains. He saw God work miraculously in his own life and in the life of the church. And Paul saw friends fall away. Paul knew that the church likewise would experience great highs and difficult lows. And yet there is always cause for thanksgiving. The church in Corinth to whom Paul wrote this letter, uh, the church at Corinth, they had experienced such highs and lows as well. The church started on good footing. Paul himself had founded the church. Paul led the charge, and many were saved, including the leader of the local synagogue. He preached week after week in the synagogue, and the leader was eventually saved. But now three years since Paul had left the church, the church was struggling with sin. They were allowing the corrupt culture to influence their practices. The church saw such highs and such lows because it was made up of sinners like you and me. The struggles of the early church weren't so different from our struggles because it was made up of people like us. And Paul provides encouragement to the church that through it all, through highs and lows and everywhere in between, God's faithful work in the believer gives us constant cause for thanksgiving. Paul wanted them to know that there are always reasons for the believer to give thanks to God. And believer, you can constantly thank God. You can constantly thank God because your reasons for thanksgiving are not based on you or based on your performance. The believer's thanksgiving is built upon God's faithful work inside of him. This morning we're going to see from 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. We'll be in four, verses 4 through 9 of 1 Corinthians. We'll see... How Paul told the church that he constantly thanked God for his activity in their lives. And he'll give four expressions of that thanksgiving. Paul thanks God for his activity in the Corinthian believers. And this is seen in four works of God. Read with me from 1 Corinthians. We'll be in verses 4 through 9. Paul wrote to the church. I thank my God always concerning you. For the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul thanked God for his activity in the Corinthian believers constantly. We'll see this in four works of God. The first work that we'll see is that God saved believers by grace. God saved believers by his grace. Let's read verse 4 one more time. Paul wrote, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. As you look at verse 4, notice the direction of, God's, of Paul's thanksgiving. Although his thanksgiving was concerning the Corinthians, he was not directing his thanksgiving toward them. It was concerning the Corinthians, not toward the Corinthians. This is not a thank you note that he wrote to the church. His thanksgiving was directed entirely toward God. Note the first four words of the verse. Paul did not write, I thank you, Corinthians. He wrote, I thank my God. 
Paul is expressing to the church that God is truly the one who is worthy of thanksgiving. And, and this constant thanksgiving, this idea of constant thanksgiving, always thanksgiving, this is the controlling idea over our text this morning. What that means is that is that is that folds its way over every point in the text. Paul's thanksgiving extends to all of the great works of God and believers that he expresses in the following verses. Maybe you've had experiences at your children's birthdays or at Christmas like this. We have to constantly nudge them and remind them that they need to say thank you, that they need to express thankfulness for the kind gifts from friends and family. Maybe it's just my kids. Paul's thankfulness was not like this. His thankfulness for the great work of God and believers was always on the forefront of his mind. He wasn't like a child on Christmas needing to be nudged and reminded to be thankful. Paul had a regular attitude of thanksgiving for God's work in the church. And although Paul's thanksgiving was directed toward God, it wasn't as if he was a passive actor in all this, as if he wasn't involved in any way you'll notice that Paul thanked God for things that Paul himself had worked very hard for. Paul had worked incredibly hard to bring the gospel to the New Testament church and specifically to the church at Corinth. He spent 18 months, a year and a half of his life in the city. He went to the synagogue week after week amidst criticism from the local population. Paul labored physically in his time at Corinth. He was working very hard. He was a tent maker while he was at Corinth preaching the gospel. And after much work, the church at Corinth had accepted Paul's message of the gospel. He was laboring physically. He was laboring week after week. And yet after all that hard work, Paul knew that all thanksgiving belongs to God because it is God who works within the believer. Notice that Paul's thanksgiving is present tense and continuous. Paul describes himself as thanking God always in verse 4. There was not a moment in any day where where Paul could not give thanks to God for his work in believers, even when they were struggling. If you know one thing about the Church of Corinthians, if you only knew one thing, it would probably not be a good thing. Uh, There was a lot wrong at the church in Corinth. They were struggling. If you read the book, you'll quickly discover that this was not an exemplary church. The city of Corinth, outside of the church, was incredibly gross. It was really debaucherous. Uh, And the church in Corinth had allowed themselves to be influenced by the surrounding culture. They were taking place in the culture's sins, um, taking part really in the worst of them to a degree that even offended the culture. This church was very clearly struggling with issues of holiness, love, and obedience. And later in the book, Paul would have much to say about this. Paul would have much to say about changes necessary within the church in regards to holiness. But their current struggles did not remove his cause to thank God that God had saved them. Again, that's, not because, that's because his thankfulness was not based on the behavior of the believers, but on their current status as believers. Paul's thankfulness was not on their current behavior because of the current behavior of the believers, but on their current status as believers. And likewise, our grounds for constant thanksgiving of, for, to God, grounds are not our, our current behavior but our current status as ones who have been saved by God. This current status as believers is based on a past tense reality already accomplished by God. Look at the past tense used in verse 4. The grace of God was given. This is a past reality for the believer. It cannot change. Because this cannot change, our cause for thanksgiving never changes. It's never removed. This grace from God is received at the the moment that the believer places his trust in Christ. And Paul further expresses at the end of verse 4 that this gift of God was given to the believer in Christ Jesus. Salvation is found nowhere else and only in Christ. Paul would expound upon this idea later in in his letter to the church at Corinth. Turn with me just a few pages, turn over with me, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll be reading verse 3. Toward the end of his letter, Paul expounded upon what it means that the believer has been, been given the grace of God in Christ. What does that mean? Let's read verse 3 together. Paul reminded them here 
I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What was our part in that? Once again, you, you and I had no hand in this. Christ died, Christ was buried, and Christ was raised on the third day. The, the only part that we have in this is committing the sins that he took upon himself and died for. There's nothing here for which we deserve thanks. And this is the basis of Paul's thanksgiving here. This is the message of the gospel. This is what it means that the grace of God was given in Christ. The great grace of God given to the believer was in his very son, Jesus. The grace of God given to the believer was given in the person of Christ. And and like Paul, we can be thankful because he sent his son to die on our behalf. And in his death, and in his subsequent victory over death, he accomplished something wonderful on our behalf. An exchange in which he took upon himself all the sins of the world of those who would believe so that we might be seen as righteous, clothed with his righteousness. I hope that this message of forgiveness at the cross has not grown dull to you. I hope that the grace of God in Christ has not become stale, this message of forgiveness through Christ on the cross. It should lead us, like Paul, into a place of constant thanksgiving and praise for the one who gave us his great grace. We owe our constant thanksgiving to God because he did something in us that we could never do. God has promised that he will save all who repent and believe, but only those who have trusted in Christ will have this reason for constant thanksgiving. If you've not trusted in Christ, then you may feel left out of everything I've been saying so far. And that's because you are. This is only for those who have trusted in Christ. And while you are left out of this reason for thanksgiving now, you don't have to be. There is great grace found at the cross of Jesus. I would implore you to turn to him in faith and repentance. Turn to him alone for his great work and salvation, and you too will be able to thank God for his great grace and salvation. But for those of us who have trusted in Christ for our salvation, the passive nature of our salvation must destroy any pride that we might have in our position. This isn't something that we accomplished. This isn't something that we deserved. Our salvation must not lead us to a self-promoting pride, but to a humble thanksgiving before God. Banksy, some of you may have heard of him. He's a famous street artist based in England. I want you to imagine for me, with me for a moment that Banksy decided to paint you a custom portrait as a gift. He, he found some reason for love for you, and he, he scrawled across the front of this painting in huge letters, to, insert your name here, from Banksy, with love. You would probably show your friends this wonderful gift, and I want you to imagine if when your friends asked you to tell the story behind this wonderful gift, you told them, oh yeah, I painted that a few weeks ago, Banksy gave me a hand. You would sound really ridiculous. And, and more than just ridiculous, you would be dishonoring the giver. You'd sound ridiculous because the text on the work clearly states who authored it. And you'd be dishonoring the giver because you were improperly taking credit for his kind gift. Likewise, we cannot take credit for the great gift given to us by the author of our salvation. The text here makes it clear that God himself is the author of our salvation, and we must remain ever grateful never taking pride in that gift. Scripture surely requires much more than just thankfulness to God for what he accomplished. But a lack of thanksgiving for God's work in your life is, is pretty revealing. A few weeks ago, out of the blue, my employer decided to do something nice for us. Uh, they emailed us and they said that every employee was getting a free $10 gift card to one of dozens of different locations. Being a mostly online company, they sent out this information via email. All you had to do was follow the link and choose your gift card. Mine was for coffee, as some of you can imagine. 
I got mine right away. I was super grateful. I thought it was pretty cool. And so I started reaching out to several of my friends and coworkers so they too knew what I had been given. I wanted to share this news with them. And so they could receive, and so they knew that they could receive the same thing. My thankfulness motivated me to share the good news of the $10 gift card. And what if this had been a 50 or 100 or 100 million dollar gift card that they had been given to that had been given to me? I would have would have been all the more grateful and all the more eager to share with those who would benefit. Because we've been given something much more value, valuable than a $10 gift card, or 50, or 100, or 100 million. We've been given something of infinite worth. And if we are truly grateful for our salvation, we understand the greatness, greatness of the gift giver, the cost to the gift giver, then we would be all the more eager to share the good news that God has saved us by his grace. So saw from verse 4 that God saved believers by grace. We'll see in verses 5 and 6 that God supplied believers with riches. Read verses 5 and 6 with me. That in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You were enriched in everything. In the mid-1950s, there was a boy named David the youngest of six siblings, he lived with his family in the city of New York. He went to school one day, as he did every single day, but today was a bit unusual for David. Today his classmates were treating him differently. His classmates were murmuring about him, and they were talking about his family and perceived wealth. The other children started calling David rich. David took offense because he knew better. David knew it was true, and so David argued with his classmates. He insisted that his family was not, in fact, wealthy. He knew this wasn't true. Only David, last name Rockefeller, grandson of America's first billionaire, was quite wrong. Later, he told this story in an interview when he was much older. Uh, He said that he argued the point with his classmates because he didn't feel rich. He didn't feel as if he was wealthy. He didn't know how wealthy he truly was. His understanding of his riches was based upon what he felt, not based upon what was true. Believers, we can make the same error. We can make the same mistake that young Mr. Rockefeller did when we look in the wrong place for our riches. Paul is clear here that we've been enriched. Paul explains here that God not only saved believers, but he also supplied them with riches. Paul here describes a wonderful outworking of the grace of God in every believer. He's reminding the believers that when they are saved, they were also enriched in everything in Christ. Note the extreme words he uses here in verse 5. The words everything and all and all. This is a continuation of some pretty extreme statements from the apostle Uh, He had already said that he was always giving thanks. He said that he was always thankful. And and now in verse 5, he's saying they were enriched in everything, in all speech, in all knowledge. Paul is clearly not writing about material riches. Certainly that whole church in Corinth was not wealthy. Certainly this church here at Grace Bible Church is not all wealthy. And this isn't any sort of a health and wealth gospel. This isn't a promise about what's coming, future wealth, future money, future worldly success. Notice the continued use of the past tense. This is not a future promise, but a past tense reason for thanksgiving. In verse 4, he said, the grace of God was given, past tense. And in verse 5, in everything you were enriched, also past tense. This enriching that he's talking about is based upon something that was accomplished in the past for the Christian. So what was this past enrichment of the believer? Well, this enrichment was in everything, and that in everything goes under the umbrella of in him. The in everything is qualified by the words in him. In the realm of all that is in him, in Christ, the believer was enriched in everything. Like the grace of God that was given in Christ Jesus in verse 4, 
This enriching is also in Christ, as you can see in verse 5 here. It's in him. Paul explained this enriching a little bit more in another letter that he wrote to the church. He expanded upon this idea of a believer's past tense enrichment. Turn just a few pages over to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul expounds upon this idea, uh, or expands upon this idea of a believer's past enrichment. Paul wrote to this same church in 2 Corinthians, another letter. He wrote these words. He wrote that they knew that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Go ahead and turn back over to our passage. In our salvation, God granted to us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness, and this is everything that we need. This is not earned wealth. Just like the grace of God and salvation was given to us by God, this enrichment was a gift from our our loving God. And once again, this is a passive idea. Believers haven't earned these riches. You can't buckle up your bootstraps and work your way to Christ's riches. These untold riches were given to us by our good God. Believer, you may not feel wealthy, but if if this is the case, then consider what you are prizing. If you don't feel wealthy, consider what you are prizing. Don't, don't make the same mistake as this young child, David Rockefeller did, who in his ignorance insisted that he wasn't in fact rich. You've been granted riches greater than anything this world can give. The wealth of the Rockefellers has nothing on Christ's riches. God has not held back from blessing his church with these riches. Paul went on to explain that this enrichment is in everything in Christ. And while this enrichment, he's he's very expansive in his language, this enrichment is in everything, he goes on to give two specific examples of what this in everything means for the church. Two specific expressions of God's gracious enrichment. He says it is in all speech and all knowledge. Speech and knowledge are primarily in reference, these terms are primarily in reference to the church's interactions with the world outside of this body as we interact with the world around us, not not primarily with the inner workings of the church. Here he's speaking of our gospel witness. He wasn't explaining away the exhaustive nature of our riches in Christ. He didn't say in everything and then try to excuse it by, by specifying these two ways. He's saying it's in everything, and there's a reason he specified in all speech and all knowledge. He was focusing his explanation on two categories that were held really highly within the church at Corinth. Remember, the apostle had spent 18 months with this church, a year and a half. He got to know their culture and their people and their customs. Corinthian culture placed very high value on intelligent speech and skilled rhetoric. They wanted you to be able to argue your point and sound intelligent. Paul would use these terms speech and knowledge several more times within the book of 1 Corinthians. This church, which was following its culture in a lot of ways, likely placed a very high high value on intelligence and argumentation. They may have felt as if they were not up to par with their culture in these categories, that they, they could not adequately share the gospel. Perhaps you feel this way. But Paul wanted them to know that Christ's enrichment truly is in everything in everything, including all speech and all knowledge. This enrichment went so far as to cover categories of of even speech and knowledge which this church might struggle with, might struggle to believe. If, If we remain grateful, remember Thanksgiving is the overarching idea behind this passage, if we remain grateful to God that he has enriched us in everything, if we remember that he has enriched us in all speech and all knowledge, then we will likely share the good news of Christ with more boldness, with more frequency. It will keep us from using artificial excuses to cower behind our comforts. 
In verse 6, Paul reminded them of what this enriching indicated. Look, look at verse 6 to see that this enriching was, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. The testimony of Christ here refers again to God's saving work in the believer. Paul is encouraging them that the presence of spiritual enrichment is evidence. This is evidence of their salvation. The testimony of Christ here uh, refers to God's saving work in the believer. Uh, God's enrichment of the believer is because of salvation by grace, and it is evidence of salvation by grace. God's enrichment of us is, is because of salvation by grace, and it is evidence of salvation by grace. Notice also that Paul has continued his use of passive verbs here. They didn't confirm the testimony of Christ in themselves through their actions. No, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them as they were enriched in him. Again, Paul gets no credit here. The Corinthians get no credit here. God's active role and the believer's passive role are once again on display in these reasons for thanksgiving. Like the Corinthians, we must never forget Christ's great riches that have been given to us in salvation. This has been, we have been given everything that we need in Christ, and this must motivate us to thank him for his good gifts. It should keep us from complaining. When we complain, we are revealing that we are not truly trusting that God has enriched us in everything. Our lives may not always be easy. Surely you know this. Health difficulties, financial struggles, relationship problems will arise. But Christ has given us everything that we need in him. It may not always be easy or convenient. And certainly it's not always easy or convenient to testify to his grace. But he has enriched us in all speech and all knowledge. We're not lacking anything that we need in Christ. Take comfort that you have everything that you need in him and let it be a motivation for your constant attitude of thanksgiving. So we saw from verse four that God saved believers by grace. We read in verses five and six how God supplied believers with riches. We're gonna see in verse four that God supports believers with gifts. Excuse me, in verse seven that God supports believers with gifts. Read verse 7 with me, please. So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. After saving us, after enriching us, Christ supports us with gifts. You may know that Paul would later spend a lot of time in this book talking to Corinthians about the spiritual gifts further detailing the Christian's relationships to these gifts. But here, Paul is simply reminding them of God's kindness in giving gifts to the church. He's given us everything that we need. There, there, there isn't some sort of gift lacking. We're not lacking any gift. There isn't a, an undiscovered spiritual gift out there. There is no gift that the church needs that God has not supplied. This support that is given through gifts, this is different than the other acts of God for which we must give thanks. Thanks. This support is not past tense like the other words. This, this gifting from God. The first two reasons that God gave constant thanksgiving, that God saved believers by his grace, and that God supplied believers with riches, those are both past tense reasons. Those are both past tense realities that should result in continued thanksgiving in the life of the believer. Here in verse 7, Paul gives a present tense result of those past realities. He told the church at Corinth that at present, the church is not lacking any gift. There's not a spiritual gift missing from the church's arsenal. God had gifted the church at Corinth with every gift as a direct result of their enrichment, their salvation, and the confirmation of Christ in them. And once again, Paul gives us a passive idea. We didn't do anything. The nature of a gift is that you don't do anything to receive it. Paul gives no room for the church to take credit for the gifts of God given to the church. He did not write, you have attained every gift. They didn't attain anything. It wasn't based on them, but they were not lacking in any gift. This proper understanding of our gifts and their source 
should remove any pride or self-exaltation in us, in our areas of gifting. Should remove any pride. Are, are you specially gifted in the area of teaching? Maybe you're excellent in service. Maybe you're great with hospitality. Praise God. Because it came from him and not from you. These gifts that you've been given must not motivate you toward pride, but it must motiv- they must motivate you toward humble service. So the church has many gifts. We're not lacking in any gifts, but what do we do with them? What did Paul want the Corinthians to do in response to these gifts? What came to his mind next as he spoke of the gifts? Notice the connection here between the church not lacking any gifts and what comes next. Look with me at verse 7. Paul wrote, So that you are not lacking any gifts, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, the, the believer's role here is to wait eagerly. It's interesting that our major role in these verses that are full of passive things that God has done for us, our major role here is waiting. If you've been here the last few weeks, that you know, then you know that we're currently studying the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 8 right now. And, and the term used here in our verses for eagerly awaiting, that's the same term used in the book of Romans chapter 8. Smed preached this a few weeks ago. Uh, about how creation itself is eagerly awaiting the future hope. Not only creation. Romans chapter 8 goes on to say that we ourselves look to the future with this eager anticipation. The exact same term, it's, it's one word in Greek, that same term is used here. These gifts give, given by God allow us to serve one another as we look forward to our promised future. Those two ideas are connected. Have you ever noticed differently? Have you ever noticed that the way you wait depends on what you're waiting for? I wait much differently based on what I'm waiting for. If any of you have spent time at the DMV, or or maybe it's called MVD here, you know that when you're waiting to register your car and you're waiting for your number to be called at the DMV, you're waiting much differently than a groom waiting for his bride as she comes down the aisle. One of them is the DMV. And one of them is an eager, hopeful waiting. The groom is eagerly awaiting in anticipation of marrying his beloved. Believer, our our waiting is not bored and lifeless. Like we're the DMV. Our waiting involves eagerness because we know what is to come. And while the reasons for thanksgiving, we are thankful because, God's work, because of God's works in us, because while those reasons for thanksgiving are passive, our waiting is not a passive waiting, just sitting around. We know from the rest of this letter, if, if, if you read the rest of the letter, Paul, Paul makes that clear. The church was not just to sit around. Our, our waiting involves work to grow in sanctification. Our waiting involves diligently serving one another. God has given us everything that we need as a body. God has given us every gift that we need. We are not lacking any gift as we care for one another in this eager awaiting, as we wait for a future hope. We can be eager like the groom at his wedding because we know what is coming. We can encourage one another and remind one another of what is to come. We can be eager because we know what is coming with our future hope. Look, look again with me at verse 7. The great gifts from God support the believer as he eagerly awaits. And what is he eagerly awaiting? Look at verse 7. The revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The revealing of our Lord. This is why our waiting is eager. When Paul writes the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not, this is not a rapture passage, He's referring to the Lord's promised coming in which he will return as king. Just as the groom knows that his bride is headed down the aisle, the believer knows that Christ is coming in goodness and splendor as king. We're eager. We are motivated to be eager because we know that in his coming, he will be exalted. 2,000 years of mockery and hatred will lead into him being magnified. 
on the earth. We know that suffering will end for those who believe in Christ. And he will restore all things. This should make us thankful. It should make us eager. God has supported us with gifts so that we might encourage one another as we await our future hope. These gifts are to be used in service of the church. Everyone in this church is gifted differently. And you're gifted differently for service in the church so that we can care for one another as we await this future coming. Consider the wonderful gifts that God has given you and your station in life. Are you hoarding them? Are you holding on to them selfishly, practicing them apart from people in the church? Or are you engaging with the church, encouraging us, loving us, caring for us, helping us as we await eagerly our coming king? It's not always easy to wait. Life's trials, life's highs and lows make it difficult at times. We've experienced this. Corinth experienced this. If you're not experiencing this currently, you will. And as a church, we can care for one another in the ways that God has specially gifted us. We, we experienced this years ago when we had some, some health issues in our family. And this church has been exemplary in that. But let's, let's continue in that. Let's, let's grow in that. And if you found that you're not using your gifts in service of the church, we always need help in child care. There's always opportunities for service and for love for your brothers as we await. These gifts of God has given us gifts so that we can love one another and encourage one another and remind one another of what is to come. Our king is coming and we should look forward in eager anticipation. Let's use our gifts that God has given us to love one another and support each other in that. So we saw that God saved believers by his grace. We saw that God supplied believers with riches. We saw that God supports believers with gifts. Lastly here, we're going to see that God sustains believers to the end. God sustains believers to the end. Verses 8 and 9, Paul wrote, uh, continuing off of verse 7 where he's talking of Christ, he wrote, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. John MacArthur famously said, if you could lose your salvation, you would. If you could lose your salvation, you would. By that, he meant that if our salvation was sustained by anything natural in us, then it would surely be lost. No more can we save ourselves than we can sustain ourselves. But praise be to God that he doesn't rely on us to sustain ourselves. He has promised to sustain us to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can change this, not difficulty, not illness, not death, which Christ has conquered. After giving us two past tense reasons, one present tense reason, and one present tense reason for thanking God, Paul here gives a reason based on our future hope. Notice the future tense here in verse uh, verse 8. It says, who will confirm, or some translations, if you have the ESV, it says, who will sustain to the end. Believer, God will sustain you to the end through it all. When the day of Christ comes, Jesus will present the church to his Father as blameless. What a great reason to thank God. And the reason that this should bring us to a point of constant thanksgiving, the reason we should never lose our thankfulness over this point is because we know ourselves. We know our struggle with sin. Even the godliest of saints, 
and the godliest of churches with the godliest of reputations struggles with sin. How much more you and me. We can look back on some of the most amazing believers from the past, people who we would hold in very high esteem and see some real black marks on their character. We can see some real sin in their lives. People whom we revere like Martin Luther and Jonathan Edwards and Amy Carmichael. In the holiest of saints, there still existed much sin. And if they could not be sinless, how can we? We can't. And this neither excuses us from our sin. We can't look back on them and say, well, they sinned, so can I. This doesn't excuse our sin, nor does it whitewash theirs. But it shows that even the the godliest of saints cannot claim sinlessness. So then why would we be declared blameless by God? It's incredible that we would be declared blameless because we know ourselves and we know our sin nature. Wouldn't take you long to think back to your last sin, to your last failure. We, we experience struggle against the world and our own flesh. We fail to obey God in our interactions with our family. We're not even always kind to our spouses and our children. We, we fail to obey God in our workplace interactions, in our thoughts. We constantly fail. While the fact of our failure is not an excuse for it, we will still be confirmed as blameless in the end. Just as we were not saved by grace because we deserve it, just as we were not supplied with riches because we earned them, just as we were not given gifts because we deserved it, we are not sustained based on what we deserve inherently. This isn't something that we accomplished but we are sustained until the end. We are sustained until the end and we will be declared blameless because Jesus took upon himself our sins upon the cross and he clothed us with his righteousness which can never be taken away. We can be sure of him who called us. We can be sure because of him who called us. What is the character of the one who called us into salvation who gives us these gifts, who enriches us, who promises to sustain us to the end, what is his character? Read the first three words of verse 9 with me. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful through whom we were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Just as Paul's thanksgiving is a controlling idea over this whole section, for all of this, he's giving thanks to God on behalf of the Corinthians. God's faithfulness is necessary for any of this to be true. Without a faithful God, we don't have these reasons for thanksgiving. But God is faithful. God called us into fellowship with his own son, whom he sent to die on our behalf. God was faithful in our salvation, God was faithful in his support. God God will be faithful to sustain us. This is past, present, future, and always, because it's who he is. In salvation, this calling is his, this calling that he mentions here, this is his effectual calling unto salvation. God's faithfulness is tied to his salvation of believers here. And in salvation, God called us into a place of fellowship with his son, fellowship with Christ, We've been made one in Christ because God gave that to us as a gift. He called us and he will keep us because he is faithful. Our thanksgiving to God for what he's done hinges on his faithfulness, not on anything we've accomplished. And we know that God is faithful. Look at your Old Testament, your New Testament. Look at your history. Look at the saints that we've lost here. God was faithful. God was faithful to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses. Think of Joshua, to John the Baptist as he was beheaded. God was faithful to Ruth, to Rahab, to Peter, to Paul. We could go through Apollos, Athanasius, Martin Luther in the Reformation, Martin Lloyd-Jones more recently, many saints that we've lost. 
countless friends and family who you've lost that I don't even know. God has been faithful. God was, God is, and God will be faithful to those whom he has called. It doesn't change. Because just as we are sinners by nature, he is faithful by nature. It's who he is. We must be ever grateful to our God. We have constant cause for thanksgiving for what he did, for what he does, and for what he will do, for who he is. He is faithful. He saved us by grace. He supplied us with riches, and he supports us with gifts. And he promises to sustain us to the end. Please pray with me. God, you are a God of salvation. You are a God who supports us with gifts. We've been enriched, Lord. You have given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. There's nothing that we need that you have not given us, Lord. As we face the highs and lows, the trials of life, the joys of life, Lord, let us not lose sight of your faithfulness to us, of your faithful salvation, of your faithful care for us now, and that you will sustain us to the end, Lord. Pray that you would keep us ever, ever grateful. And as we walk through our lives, Lord, as we face these highs and lows, that we would remain ever conscious of our ability to support one another, encourage one another with the gifts that you have given us. Pray that you would help us to, to love one another and not hold back from the gifts you have given us as we love the body. Pray all of this in your great name. Lord, for we are so grateful to you. Amen.